Yes, yeah, so hi, I'm uh, James. I'm a contract technical writer from London, and today I'm going to be talking to you about error messages. So from my experience, I found like the core focus of most documentation teams I've worked in has been the sort of instructional docs, so like whether that's user guides or how-to material or maybe training material. Um, and while error messages are essentially just microcopy, I think they deserve more attention than they currently receive. Because if you get error messages wrong, it can not only lead to customer frustration and dissatisfaction, but also ridicule on social media. And then in worst cases, it can cost your company's time and money. So, and these nine words proved uh, pretty costly to a company back in 2003. They simply said, this page is too large to be shown completely. So customers had no idea what it meant, what to do, and they emailed and called the customer support team um, hundreds of times over a two-year period. And the technical writer, Emily Wilkeser, went to the customer support and basically found out this had cost them $50,000, so about 45,000 euros, and probably a lot less in, in pounds right now because of Brexit. Um, and they, they were surprised, as she was, that such a, a few simple, if wildly unhelpful words had cost them so much. Um, and the cost wasn't strictly monetary either. So while they had no proof of cus uh, loss of customers or subscribers, uh, she had little doubt this error message contrib contributed to customer frustration and dissatisfaction. She said, the relatively small amount of effort and development time required to improve this message would have paid off in a better user experience and a more usable product. And one of the reasons error messages, error messages are so important is they can evoke incredibly strong and negative uh, emotions in your end users. So imagine if you're working to a deadline and your software crashes and you see an error. You know, you're going to feel confused, maybe frustrated, distressed, or perhaps even angry. And one of the reasons for this is um, error messages actually cause your body to produce cortisol, the stress hormone, which is what I'm feeling now. Um, <laughs> so that not only increases your blood pressure, but it increases stress. So if error, mes error messages are unhelpful, customers are more likely to become frustrated and give up on your product. OK, so what's the problem? Um, when I've been asked by developers for help with error messages in the past, I couldn't actually find a definitive guide. So this guide doesn't exist. Um, if anyone from O'Reilly is watching this, please don't sue me. Um, the only O'Reilly book I could actually find was specifically about developing Windows errors. And the author, Ben Azell, felt based that one of the main issues with error messages was because they're so closely tied to the code, they're often written by programmers whose strengths lie in writing and debugging complex code, but not necessarily in interpersonal communication. His words, not mine. And writing documentation. You know, most developers hate writing docs. He felt if more eff effort went into error messages, they would be seen as less of, a, less of a joke and would be recognized for their real value as information intended to help us, the user, to learn how to operate complex software. So what is an error message? It's essentially documentation um, that inf informs the user that there's been an error. And it comes in three main elements. So you have the notification that something went, something went wrong. Because there's nothing worse than your product failing silently. Um, there's an explanation of why the thing went wrong, the cause of the error. And then ideally, they, it provides a solution to the problem, so useful, actionable information that allows the user to resolve the error and ideally prevent it happening again. However, in reality, there are a number of common issues with error messages. Either the text is so unclear it creates more confusion rather than helping the, um, helping the user, or um, they're so badly written or contain de developer jargon so users don't actually understand what has gone wrong. And also, a lot of error messages I found uh, were dead ends, so they had no resolving steps um, that would help the user fix the problem. So how can we improve error messages? Uh, like with most documentation, we should probably think about the audience um, as, a, as a starting point. You know, who is the error message for? And if you're writing an error message for an API, you, your audience is probably going to be a developer or a programmer. If your failure can only be resolved by someone with um, ad admin access, the error message is probably only going to make sense to an, admi sorry, to an administrator. <laughs> However, if you're writing error message for an interactive piece of software, the best thing is probably to, write, uh, to make them accessible to everyone. And part of making error messages accessible is being humble. So 
This is a common joke in tech support. It's a PEPCAC error, so the problem exists between keyboard and computer, or sometimes it's a picnic error, so problem in chair, not in computer. Obviously, this is not the attitude we should adopt. Um, in reality, if there's been a PEPCAC error, it's probably because there's a, a failure in the product, or the UI, UI design, or the UX design, or even an issue with the documentation. And even if it was the user's fault, we should focus on the problem and how to resolve it, and not the user action that led to the problem. Uh, and being humble also means we sometimes need to apologize. Apologizing makes error messages feel more like a human-to-human -human interaction rather than a machine-to-human interaction. But I'll touch upon the importance of being human later on. Um, so research actually found that people are more receptive towards software that offered courtesy or apologized, even if it didn't necessarily improve the performance in any way. However, I would add the caveat that it's probably best to only apologize if it's a serious problem. Um, you know, if the user's lost some data or they are unable to use the software, apologizing the whole time is just going to make it f seem like in ingenuine or meaningless. But ultimately, it's probably it's up to you whether it fits with your company and your brand, um, and yeah, for you to make up uh, your minds as to when you feel it's appropriate to apologize. Another part of being humble is not attributing blame. So don't use words like illegal um, that makes your user feel like a criminal. So this one said, you have entered an illegal object name character. So using loaded language or accusatory words like illegal or prohibited or fatal or you have done X incorrectly implies the user's made a mistake or done something wrong. And studies have actually found that users' self-appraisal of their own performance using software dropped when they encountered an error message. So effectively, error messages make people feel bad about themselves already. We don't need to use accusatory language to make them feel even worse. Bearing that in mind, we should also be helpful. So when I searched online for unhelpful error messages, uh, there were lots of examples that, were just, that just said sorry or oops, something went wrong. So these are all dead ends. They don't offer any resolving steps. Um, and dead ends are a problem. So a uh, university in Arizona took a sample set of 120 error, error messages they encountered over a two-month period, and only 29 of those provided a solution, so 20, less, less than a quarter. If you're going to use like a generic error like this, um, it's probably best to, or a better alternative would be to do something like this, where you've got two resolving steps. So one, try again, um, perhaps that will resolve the problem, or even give a link to your help center and your documentation where they might be able to find a solution for themselves. Um, another part of being helpful is avoiding ambiguity. So I found this beautifully useless and confusing error message on Twitter, and it said, you have used the extension PNG at the end of a name. The standard uh, extension is PNG, and the options it provided to resolve this were use PNG, cancel, or use PNG. <laughs> so, it's not clear what has happened here, why it happened, or what on earth users should do. Um, my guess is they probably tried to rename a JPEG uh, without actually converting it into a PNG or the file was corrupt. But either way, it's too ambiguous. Um, this kind of error is just going to confuse and frustrate your end users. Um, ambiguity also creates more questions than answers. So this is an error message I found on um, GitHub, and it said, something is wrong with your requested resources, fill it properly and try again. So something is wrong. What is wrong? Requested resources, which ones? And fill it properly, how? How do I do this? Um, so this was actually an API gateway tool, and the issue was the path hadn't been, um, that had been entered wasn't unique. So uh, res uh, a solution to this might have been to put your API path must be unique, choose a new path, and try again. So you've offered the which, the what, um, which is your API path, and the, it must be unique, and the how, choose a new path and try again. Um, and this solution also uh, provides less text, which is important because we should also try and be concise with error messages for several reasons. Firstly, um, there's actually a correlation between shorter sen sentence length and how much readers um, understand. So with eight words or less, readers understood 100% of a sentence, 14 words uh, or more, they understood 90%, uh, and then 43 words or more. Uh, comprehension actually dropped to less than 10%. Uh, secondly, modern readers scan text. So on the average web page, readers only actually read between 20 and 28% of the words on the screen. So if you've got a really long error message with important information, they're not gonna, they might not necessarily read it all. 
And also with error messages, we only have a limited amount of space anyway, so keeping it short and concise is probably the best approach. So we should also be clear and avoid jargon in error messaging. So this is another example I found on Twitter, um, and the user was really frustrated because she'd been trying to add a password and was getting this error back, and it said, password was not validated, invalid password, min character groups of three not fulfilled, error code 400. So as well as being incredibly robotic, it's, um, yeah, it contains, so validated, which is developer jargon, validation doesn't mean anything to most end users. Character, uh, character groups is internal jargon, so the developer knows what those uh, character groups are, but most users aren't. And an error code, so you've got an error code 400, so they can look that up and find out it meets a bad request error, but it's not very helpful, it's not, it's not needed here. So always trying to simplify the text to get the core message across. So in this case, all they needed to say was, your password must contain a lowercase character, an uppercase character, and a special character. So we should also try and be human. So avoiding words like uh, dependency and unhandled exception um, component, like these are all gonna raise more, like with ambiguity, they're gonna create more questions than answers. Instead of using developer jargon, I think the best way to help users is to speak to them on a human level. So Slack is a company that's very good at being human and empathetic towards their end users, and they try and make it feel like you're interacting with another human. Um, the, head, the head of brand communications, Anne Picard, spoke about error messages recently in a, in a talk she gave, where she gave this example of empathy. It said, apologies, we're having some trouble with your WebSocket connection. We've seen this problem clear up with a restart of Slack, a solution which we, we suggest to you now only with great regret and self-loathing. So she said that rather than being angry, people were going on Twitter and saying how lovely and charming this was and how much they loved Slack. And she thinks it's because it showed that empathy is a two-way street it suddenly becomes a moment where users see the people behind the product. It says, we recognize your frustration, we apologize for it, and we feel it because we're frustrated too. And being human also raises the question of whether we should use humor in error messages. So this is something that happened on a regular basis at a startup I used to work at where one of the developers um, used to always get stuck in traffic and he would post on the out of office Slack channel and we would respond with emoji reactions to create a digital traffic jam. Um, however, when you try to add more than 23 emoji reactions, you receive this error. You've reached your reaction limit. You're overreacting, we think. <laughs> So Anna Picard said that although error messages are a difficult place to put personality in humor, you can do that here because you know the person isn't in a state of work, they're not stressed, they're searching for the 24th emoji to add to a message. So this also raises the question of whether we should use humor in error messages. So this is kind of trend where a lot of companies use 404s and um, use humor in 404s and in 500 errors. But I think it is a risky place to use humor, like she said. So this was a, an amusing one, I think, uh, that I found again online, which said, whoops, you found a dead link. So, <laughs> but not everyone is gonna get this reference. You're only gonna understand this joke if you've, if you've played Zelda or you, you grew up knowing, yeah, playing on Nintendo and knowing that the main character in Zelda is called Link. So humor doesn't come without risks, particularly if it comes to cultural or um, translation, translation issues. So there were also risks with using humor in frequent or frustrating errors. So this error message appeared in a beta run of a now uh, a former social media network called Orkut, which said, bad, bad server, no donut for you. And Douglas Edwards, who wrote this error, said that attempts at humor weren't so funny when it came to translating them into languages in which the jokes didn't work or if they wore out from overexposure. And that's what happened with this one. So he found this, this error grew tired as the service crashed time and time again. So he thought he'd written this amusing tribute to an obscure, half-remembered cartoon, but this page became the, the focus of intense user frustration. And he said, a search for bad, bad server still brings up to 10,000 results, most of them rants about connectivity problems. Okay, so this is a, another real error message my wife came across and sent to me, and she actually said, is this an error message? So does, does anyone here know what a goose egg is? What, one, two, okay, a couple. So, if you're from uh, the UK, like me, or if you're European, you might find this confusing. You know, what on earth is a goose egg? It doesn't really mean anything to us. 
Um, but after looking online, uh, I found out that in the US, where this company is based, and specifically in baseball, a goose egg means a zero score. So, and that, I think that's a reference to an egg being uh, zero shaped or zero being egg shaped. Um, it basically meant the search had returned no results. Um, and the trouble with this error message, it only makes sense to a, a local, localized section of your users. So if you're a multinational company with a global customer base, you risk alienating and confusing a good portion of them. Because humor doesn't function in a vacuum, jokes can't be understood without context. Um, so this is another one you might have seen before. So I think this one works. It's, it's, it's an example of where a company knows their customer base uh, and it's a reference to Star Wars. These are not the droids you're looking for. Um, and I think you, they can get away with it because GitHub know that some of their, well, the majority of their, fa their uh, users are gonna be Star Wars fans or at least identify with Star Wars. So it feels more like a reward or a secret in-joke rather than an, an annoyance. So my tips on humor would be use humor with caution. Um, don't use humor for frequent or frustrating errors. Beware of translation issues. Um, and humor generally works best if it's an Easter egg. So another attempt to humanize or inject humor into error messages is this trend of fail pets or error mascots, and you might recognize some of these. Um, so the idea behind mascots is to humanize error messages or build warm feelings um, when an error occurs and create with this kind of less techy, kind of friendly, cute, cute character. Um, and it's intended to evoke empathy and perhaps reduce user frustration. However, Sean Rintel, he's a, a researcher at Microsoft, warned that while fail pets can improve rec the recognition of errors, that same recognition carries the danger of highlighting service failure, which is what happened with this one. So this is uh, Twitter's uh, farewell image that was, um, so it was brought in to replace their lolcat error back in 2008. And the founder of Twitter, Biz Stone, felt this suggested a team effort to accomplish something difficult. Um, when the Twitter service went down continually in the 2000s, it gained a lot of attention, was dubbed the farewell, and users loved it. They put it on mugs and t-shirts and games, and it sort of became like the stamp of being a, a Twitter user. However, Twitter also realized um, as this grew in popularity, it also increased the brand's association with failure. So they decided to scrap it. Um, and Christopher Fry, their VP of engineering, said, it had a long history and some of our users felt very connected to it, but in the end, it represented a time when I don't think we lived up to what the world needed Twitter to be. Um, and when Mozilla came to uh, redesigning their error, error messages, they actually considered using this uh, Japanese version of the Firefox mascot, um, but ultimately decided against it. The lead designer said he didn't want to create something that was too memorable since it would inevitably be become the symbol of our failure. So they, they decided they'd rather have mascots associated with the positive things they were doing rather than the negative. So just quickly, so my um, pros and cons for fail pets are, yes, they can evoke empathy and reduce frustration in your end users and also enable rapid rec recognition of errors. But they also make your errors more memorable um, and sometimes actually skew the perception of how many uh, errors your services had. Increase, with increased popularity, it also increases association with failure, and like with humor, there can also be issues with translation. So another aspect of errors that can have translation issues is color. So I don't know if you've, any of you have watched the cartoon Final Space, but it, it opens with the main character, Gary Goodspeed, floating through space, and he's got this leak in his spacesuit, and he's being told by the ship's computer he's got 10 minutes to live. Uh, so he looks down at his uh, monitor on his wrist, and he sees, sees this green error message that says, warning, uh, oxy oxygen remaining 3%. And he says, huh, look at that. They went with green for a red alert. I mean, I would have gone with red. And there's a reason for that. So in Western culture, red is, historically has a negative meaning or is, and is used for warnings because of natural connotations with um, danger. So things like blood and fire and anger. However, the color red has different connotations in different cultures. So in China, um, red is, is associated with prosperity and good luck and success, um, and is often used for positive things. And this trend is true in neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. So in China, um, money's gifted in red envelopes. Uh, this square emoji in the middle actually is a part, means you've passed an exam. It's a passing grade. And the one at the bottom, the emoji for increase, 
the default original one was a red line for increase and a green line for decrease, which is similar to the um, stock market, where if a stock stock's value increases in value, it, it's, it's red, and if it decreases, it's green. So color can be open to mistranslation in different countries. And another factor con to consider with color is accessibility, sometimes re referred to as alley. So almost 300 million people have some form of colorblindness, with the majority suffering from um, red-green colorblindness. And the problem with this is that the majority of error messages universally use, follow the colors of the traffic lights. So red for failures and important warnings, green for success and uh, encouragement, and orange and yellow for transient warnings and everything in between. However, if you were to run these um, error messages through a colorblindness filter, you can see how difficult it might be for someone with colorblindness to distinguish between the two. So we, sh we shouldn't rely on color alone. Um, instead, we should use things like a tick for success or a cross for failure, perhaps an exclamation mark for a, a warning. And it's not just colorblindness we need to think about. So dealing with error messages is frustrating for most users. So imagine how frustrating it must be for people with a disability, whether that's um, limited vision or cognitive abilities. 71% of people actually with disabilities actually leave a website if it's not accessible. So in order to make error forms um, more accessible, we can think about three things. Firstly, to um, adopt an errors on top approach, so place errors at the top of a form. So both the screen reader and keyboard readers will find the errors first without having to scroll through the whole page. Um, you should also describe the error in clear and straightforward language that can be understood if it's read out loud by, the scre by a screen reader. And it's also important to expose the error to assistive technology. So you can do that programmatically um, using ARIA. So that, that stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And these are basically attributes you can add to the HTML or JavaScript to make web applications more accessible. Um, in this case, um, I provide an example of the ARIA described by attribute. So this provides descriptive information about a UI element that might otherwise be hidden from assistive technology users. Um, and a com common example of, of using this is in password forms. So if the password the user enters in, is invalid, uh, it results in an error where the uh, ARIA described by will prompt some descriptive text explaining the minimum, pa minimum password requirements. And in this example, so password must be at least six characters. If you, if you try and enter a five-letter password, you'll get this error. So if you're not sure how accessible your error messages are, um, you can also use tools like Lighthouse, um, which is built into Chrome DevTools, or Wave, or WebAIM. And these will give you feedback on things like um, issues with color contrast, if, uh, if images are missing alt attributes, or if uh, forms are missing uh, labels. And they can also evaluate text such as link names, whether, so whether the link name can be understood when read aloud. And another great resource which I've added at the bottom is the Ali Project website, which has a checklist and resources with links to tools and courses you can use to improve accessibility. So ultimately, my key takeaway today is to remember the word hack. So a strategy or technique for managing one's time or activities more efficiently. In this case, we're talking about a hack to, to write more efficient error messages that will not only save your um, company's time and money, but will also improve user satisfaction. However, my hack has four H's, two A's, two C's, and a K. So if you can make your error messages um, helpful, humble, and human while taking care with humor, if you can think about audience and accessibility while also making your error messages concise and clear by avoiding ambiguity and developer jargon, you can empower your users with the knowledge to resolve any situation. Thank you.